Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Alejandro Reyes. I am uh, the Director for Knowledge Dissemination at the Asia Global Institute. So welcome to the Institute. Uh, and good afternoon. This is a uh, session on previewing G20 Osaka Summit and its implications for US-China-Japan relations. Uh, as you know, the um, G20 summit will take place next week in Osaka, uh, bringing together the countries of the G20, which the deep dark secret is that there are actually only 19, but Spain keeps getting invited. Um, and indeed, there will be other countries uh, involved, uh, invited, usually uh, at least a handful of other countries. Uh, I know that uh, Singapore will be uh, uh, represented as well. But anyway, um, what we thought we'd do as a preview to the G20, because if, as, as you know, the G20 or includes the United States, China, and Japan. And if we're to understand the dynamics in this part of the world, in the Asia Pacific, really the triangular relationship uh, that exists, the US-China, US-Japan, China-Japan, and uh, all the various combinations, it's very important to understand the dynamics of, of those relationships. Uh, so um, without further ado, I think uh, what I'll have to do is introduce um, our speaker today, uh, Yoshi Kaz Kaz Kato. Uh, Professor Kato is um, currently the adjunct associate professor at the Institute. He is also a research fellow at the Charhar Institute and a columnist for the New York Times. Chinese edition. I won't go into further details. You can find that on our website. Uh, being our respondent, as it were, uh, in our discussion is uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Cabestin, mm -hmm. who is the professor of, uh, in the department, uh, pr uh, professor of government and international studies at Hong Kong Baptist University. He's also associate researcher at the Asia Center Paris and at the French Center for Research on contemporary China and Hong Kong. So the way this will work is um, uh, Professor Kato will speak for about 20, 20 minutes, and then uh, we'll have uh, Professor Cabestan will um, provide some, uh, uh, some reaction to the uh, presentation, and, uh, and then we'll have a discussion. I just want to highlight that um, Professor Kato's talk today is really based on a working paper that's been, that he, he, he wrote the research and wrote and um, that we have available and then uh, in a shorter, in both the long version and the shorter version. But um, Professor Kato, yeah. it's all yours. Yeah. Yes, up to, up to you if you want to speak. Oh, okay, sure, sure. Oh, uh, okay, thank you, Al. And, uh, Thanks for coming, and John Pierre, thanks for coming. And uh, uh, it's a great opportunity to launch uh, this uh, working paper, uh, which focus on Japan, no, US, China, Japan, uh, terrorist relations. Uh, it's a very important and big uh, triangle relation in Asia Pacific. So, you know, it's great uh, honor to, uh, at this moment, uh, publish this paper and uh, pre previewing. Uh, what's happening, uh, what's going on in G20 summit, uh, which held in Osaka, Japan. Uh, uh, first of all, I have to thank to my uh, great colleagues because you know I couldn't uh, have done this uh, very big work without their support and kindness. So thank you very much, and thanks for coming. And John here, thank you so much for coming. And uh, uh, because uh, I have maybe 20 minutes uh, to speak and basically introduce uh, what I have found out uh, through writing this paper because you, you guys know you know China US and Japan you know very you know complicated important but you know somebody said consequential but anyway it's very strategically complicated relation so you know the problem is how to understand and analyze such a big and complicated relations you know we say trilateral relations at this moment we are going to discuss Japan US and China but maybe John Pierre is from uh, France originally you say UK, France, and Germany. It's also a trilateral relation, right? And you know, Canada, US, and Mexico is important as well. So you know, there are a lot of trilateral relations in the world. But at this moment, uh, let me introduce Japan, China, and US. 
And actually, uh, as else introduced, uh, the paper is already already available uh, at the website of Asia Global Institute. So if you are interested, you can uh, download, and uh, it's relatively long, but you can uh, access to understand what I'm going to say. But now, uh, let me very briefly introduce uh, the framework of this paper, and then you know, uh, let me share with you guys uh, what I have found. Uh, maybe it's a kind of a key find findings uh, through my writing. So first of all, um, of course, you guys know, you know U.S. Japan China, U.S. China Japan relations is very complicated and consequential, and it's, it's crucially important for uh, prosperity and peace in the Asia Pacific and beyond. Uh, you know, needless to say. But uh, here, I what I want to say is a framework, analytical framework does matter. Uh, you know, because the problem is how to understand. We say Japan, U.S., China, but it's it's too you know, it's too vague, it's too abstract. So I have to say why uh, it's important. So uh, in this paper, I provided three analytical framework. Uh, one is values and ideology, values and ideological system. Uh, you know, Japan, U.S. Uh, share the democracy, you know, and the rule of law, and basically share its. Uh, value systems and common interests, even strategic interests in China is a bit different, maybe very different. So this is one angle. Another angle is economic relations. Now we say economic interdependence is pretty important, and at least providing some peaceful factor for maintaining relatively you know, stable relations among the three countries. So economic relations, this is number two. Number three is strategic and geopolitical struggles, like Korean Peninsula, South China Sea, the Taiwan Strait, you know, these geopolitical issues or factors are pretty important for shaping Asia Pacific. So how uh, the paper subtitle, how the dynamics will shape Asia Pacific. So uh, this paper firstly focus on the three bilateral relations, US-Japan, China-US, and Japan-Japan-US. Three bilateral relationships. So I, I try to analyze respectively uh, what's going on. Basically, focus on central issue. What's the central issues in each bilateral relations, and then challenges and prospects. Let me introduce later. And then, you know, uh, as a methodology, uh, except for focusing on bilateral three bilateral relationship, uh, I put three cases, case studies. Uh, one is Korean Peninsula, and one is maritime disputes like South China Sea, East China Sea, and uh, the Taiwan Strait, and then regional institution. Now you guys are maybe interested in some regional integration process like TPP. The United States already withdrew, but now Japan is leading CPTPP. Uh, in other words, TPP-11, you know, and including Canada uh, and Australia and so on. And of course we are now witnessing some RCEP, Regional Comprehensive uh, Economic Partnership. And maybe, you know, I, I am from Japan, Japanese is somehow interested in Japan, China, and ROK, uh, free trade agreement. This is also a process of regional integration. But now the situation is a bit tricky because now already the United States already withdrew from TPP, this most open, higher standard, you know, you know, regional arrangements, maybe due to the Trump administration. But now China is, China is still trying, Japan is still trying to do something. And now Japan and China, are facing RCEP, this is uh, ASEAN plus six framework. You know, Japan, China, South Korea, uh, Australia, New Zealand, India. So this is relatively agreed by the United States as well. So RCEP, TPP, CPTPP, you know, the different, you know, free economic, free, tra uh, free trade agreement. So a couple of, you know, different, but uh, maybe some, some, somehow converged, somehow diverged these regional institutions. Uh, this is a great case study for examining what's happening among three countries. And finally, I, I, al I, I would always say, you know, domestic politics matters. What's happening right now in domestic politics in U.S., China, Japan, quite important now. Of course, Trump administration is changing a lot of, not changing or arranging a lot of existing policies by the United States. Of course, like Asia pivot, rebalancing policy launched by Obama and Obama administration, I think somehow you know succeeded by Trump administration. The basic policy, like you know hedging China, even you know containment policy, somehow a lot of people now are talking about is engagement policy debt or not? It's a very important and interesting issue. 
So you know, U.S. you know pretty important, and China, needless to say, Xi Jinping, you know, you know pol politically and domestically uh, repressive, and in terms of foreign policy, now more like assertive and aggressive in the South China Sea and even the Taiwan Taiwan policy. And Japan, relatively you know less important, uh, but uh, of course a lot of people say Japan is. Uh, in decline over the last three decades, and now, but now Japan is entering new era, Reiwa. You know, Heisei era already, you know, over. So now Shinzo Abe, maybe the longest administration in, since the end of the World War II, uh, Shinzo Abe is trying to do a lot, and now, at this moment, uh, hosting the G20 summit in Osaka. Uh, so I think, you know, domestic politics matters, particularly at this moment. So, and, and, uh, uh, let me now very, very briefly uh, introduce uh, uh, each uh, what, what I'm trying to say, what I trying to frame this bilateral relationship uh, in terms of each bilateral relation. Uh, just very briefly introduce. Uh, in terms of US-China relations, uh, what's the central issues now? I think one is strategic rivalry. It's uh, you know, kind of a center of competition between US and China, and Taiwan issue, always very important. I, th I would say now, uh, looking at the landscape of Asia Pacific, I think Taiwan issue, uh, whatever is triggered, Taiwan issue is one of the most dangerous and risky uh, trigger and uncertainties in terms of maintaining peace and stability in this region and some implication for the trilateral relations. And human rights, uh, because I, in central, uh, central issues, I, in each bilateral relations, I put three central issues. So for US and China, it's strategic rivalry, strategic rivalry <coughs> Taiwan issue, and human rights. Because, and now we are looking at a lot of you know, situations in Hong <coughs> Kong, right? So human rights, I don't know how, how much Mr. Trump uh, makes points or are interested in this issue, but I think human rights continues to be important central issues for US-China relations. And in terms of challenges and prospects, I also put three things. One is trade war, economic and technological competition. Now we are, you know, we are looking at some Huawei incident. You know, this is more than economic, but more like strategic, the technological, even you know, national competition with their pride, and even some nationalism is quite important. And regional and global initiatives, and disparities in ideology, political systems and development models. I think now, under the Xi Jinping and Trump administration, now uh, this competition is more than economic or you know, geopolitical. I think, more, uh, I think uh, rather it's more like ideology, you know, the China model. Somebody says that capitalism. But now uh, China is uh, diverging. China is, not, China is not likely to accommodate the liberal democracy initiated by the United States and so on. So I think this is a very important issue. And looking at Japan-China relations, I think what would be the central issues? I put three. One is history. History, historical problems, always important for Japan and China. And territorial disputes, Senkaku and Diao in Chinese. And public sentiment. You know, Japanese diplomats, Japanese citizens always see, you know, public sentiment is pretty important for national and bilateral relations. How would how do we feel? You know, how do we feel about the other? Do we like or do we dislike? You know, this is quite important for diplomatic relations in Japan and China. And challenges, I think one is high politics. You know, how could Japan and China maintain the relatively high, you know, level or high level reciprocal visit between two countries? Uh, this could provide confidence and stability, and including for business community as well. Uh, and another one, new economic cooperation. Japanese ODA, Official Development Assistance to China, actually that support supported China's reform and opening up policy over the last four decades. And <coughs> new economic cooperation now, Japan and China, you know, emphasizes the cooperation in the third countries, like Thailand, you know, now, you know economic, Eastern <coughs> Economic Corridor. Already Ch Japan and China is trying to establish the smart city. Already something happens. And then regional cooperation. As I said, you know, RCEP, you know, CPTPP, China has never rejected or opposed TPP. Uh, I, I don't know what's happening in the future, but it's quite interesting. And looking at US-Japan US relations, I think what's the central issues? I think one is security alliance for Japan, China, Japan and the United States, how to strengthen and maintain the security alliance 
this is not easy. Because second one, Okinawa, uh, more than 70% of US base in Japan are concentrated in Okinawa. But Okinawa's size is less than 1% in Japan. So you know, you know, there are always you know, a lot of complaints and protests by Okinawa local people uh, to Jap Japanese central government and US, yeah, US army. So it's a pretty important. And China, how to deal with China? You know, this is, I think, also a central issue for Japan. China, Japan, US, USA, it's quite important. And challenges, uh, I think I have three. One is trade under the, tra under the Trump administration. Now, the United States you know, has never denied imposing additional tariffs to Japan at this moment. But Japan is allies of the United States. So it's an it's important issue. And TPP, of course, Japan is unhappy. Japan is unhappy because the United States withdrew from TPP. But this, is, this used to be the initiative, joint initiative by US and Japan. So now, you know, something new, right? And policy coordination is quite important. Now, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is trying to, for example, amend our constitution, Article 9, or our new you know, security arrangement are happening. And Shinzo Abe is trying to do something new. But the problem is how to accommodate the US, US strategy to Asia Pacific. So for Japan, USA, you know, we are allied, but you know, in a relatively stable and relatively stable policy coordination is required always. Case studies, and I very briefly go through, and maritime disputes, you know, as I said, South China Sea, uh, East China Sea, and Taiwan Strait, you know, still, still I think under the Xi Jinping and, and the Trump administration, you know, it uh, continues to be very sensitive, complicated issue. You know, now Xi Jinping looks like more assertive uh, uh, in Taiwan issue. And uh, you know, how would US respond to that? You know, no, who knows? But you know, I think at least compared to the, you know, his predecessor, I think now uncertainties and risks are increased. And the Korean Peninsula also is quite important. Right now, you know, Xi Jinping, now Xi Jinping is visiting North Korea from tomorrow before meeting Mr. Trump in Osaka. So this is you know, quite strategic, you know, you know what I, I, I'm going to say later. And the regional institution, uh, number three of case studies, you know, TPP, you know, RCEP, and Japan-China ROK, free trade agreement. These are very important case to understand and analyze what's going on among US, Japan, and China. So, and, uh, uh, policy implications, uh, this is my main findings uh, through writing this paper. Uh, let me, uh, this is, uh, I think, quite important, so maybe uh, take five to 10 minutes and to introduce what I have found, and then uh, let me stop. Uh, first of all, um, uh, the nature of US-China-Japan trilateral relations will continue to be one of the most consequential indicators of stability and prosperity in the Asia-Pacific. So this is quite important uh, relations and uh, looking at U.S.-China relations, I think under the Trump and Xi Jinping leadership, the two nations seems to be seem to have truly entered an era of strategic competition. Uh, this is actually, you know, already defined by Trump administration, and I think the trade war is just the just the tip of iceberg. This is more like strategic. So I think, and and you know, based on the divergence or disparities or political system or development model. I think now, I think US and US, US China relations, its competition, you know, is lasting uh, for a long run. Uh, this is, and I think that this is why the future of course, future course of the US China relationship will inevitably affect the evolution of human society. This is quite important. And uh, looking at Japan China relations, I think quite sensitive and emotion driven. Uh, due to its historical aspects as neighbors inevitably competing on regional initiative. And now the bilateral relationship seems to be improving. And maybe this is partly because of China's frustrations with its relations with the United States and Japan's need to desire, uh, need and desire to boost its business and econ economy by strengthening its, the political relationship with China. But now, I but I, don't, I do not think China Japan relations would be improved so much. Uh, 
because actually the you know, US and Japan have shared common and strategic interests. So China now tried to co-opt Japan to balance or counterbalance the power, counterbalance the power, power balance in the Asia Pacific, but uh, it's, it's not likely. And the US Japan relations are relatively stable, stable as long standing security allies, uh, which have shared strategic interests and even destiny. But now TPP, C CPTPP, is you know, facing a lot of challenges. Um, so I think uh, Japan and Uni United States uh, con uh, continues to be very important alliance, but the problem is how to face the right of China. This is quite important. And, uh, excuse me. and uh, in terms of evaluating the prospects of US-China-Japan trilateral relations in the Asia Pacific, I think the diplomatic agenda in 2019 should focus on three things. One is how can the US and China resolve the tr their trade dispute? This is quite important. Second, how can Japan show its initiative through the hosting of the G20 Osaka Summit? Uh, this is the second question. Third, and how can regional cooperation agreements like CP CPTPP, RCEP, and China-Japan South Korea FTA achieve substantial progress? Uh, I think these are quite important uh, indicators for examining US-China-Japan trilateral relations. Um, and uh, given the analytical framework of this paper, you know, what I introduced, uh, value and ideological system, and uh, economic relations, and geopolitical and strategic struggles, I think uh, in terms of the impact on the future course of the trilateral relations, I think values and ideological systems are the most fundamental, long-term, and relevant angle to understand and analyze China's political system and ideology are high iron likely to converge with the US and Japan. So unless some domestic turbulence which triggers a regime change occurs in China, I think you know, China is very unlikely to converge with US-Japan liberal democracy. So I would say this is the most important uh, uncertainty or indicator to examine what's going on in the future among three countries. And actually, uh, this divergence already happens. You know, for example, Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State in the United States, uh, on the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre, actually he stated like this, over the decades the follow that followed, the United States hoped that China's integration into the in international system would lead to a more open, tolerant society. Those hopes have been dashed. China's one-party state tolerate, uh, tolerates no dissent and abuse human rights uh, whenever it serves its interests. So obviously, the US has become less tolerant of China's authoritarian system. China, on the other hand, has become more aggressive and confident about managing its own political system and development model. So I think divergence is now widening and deepening. So uh, this distrust uh, based on the you know, value system divergence. Actually, this is, you know, this is very easy to trigger. The more, you know, complicated and, uh, you know, sensitive uh, geopolitical struggles uh, like Korean Peninsula, South China Sea, and Taiwan Strait. So this paper would argue that the Taiwan, Taiwan issue is the biggest challenge for the three parties in the future. So this would somehow, you know, trigger uncertainties or risks in the Asia Pacific. So this could be very important. And economic relations is somehow the most positive factor uh, for, for the trilateral relations in, in the region. Uh, but you know, as I mentioned, economic relation is now more than economic under Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping uh, uh, President Trump. Now, you know, China says China made in China 2025 and Huawei incidents. And now Mr. Trump is you know, trying to sanction or you know, give more pressure to China. So I think economic relation, uh, both bilateral and multilateral, I think it's uh, very complicated and strategically important. So, and actually, actually uh, the trade war is just, as I said, it just a, you know, you know, it's a kind of uh, part of national competition. So I think uh, 
uh, although we, I would say, you know, economic relations is, you know, relatively positive, but um, uh, in terms of uh, its importance, uh, um, you know, compared to uh, the value and ideology, syst ideology system and strategic and geopolitical struggles, this is less important. But, you know, through this paper, I would say, uh, you know, divergence of ideology and value system would be more important and most important factor to understand U.S.-China Japan relations. And uh, finally, uh, finally, uh, um, I'm sorry, I've just pulled out wisdom teeth, so I'm, I'm a bit, uh, yeah. Finally, um, let me talk about what I have not said, what I have not said in this paper. One is uh, relation with external uh, player or factor like Russia and India. Actually, uh, Professor Chen and I uh, talked about you know how to deal with Russia. Russia is pretty important uh, country uh, for U.S. Japan China uh, trilateral relations. Looking at China, Japan, U.S. and its respective pol respective policy to toward Russia. Of course, China and Pu uh, China and Russia now Putin and Xi Jinping. You know, Xi Jinping just met P uh, President Putin. Right, and uh, President Putin uh, celebrated his birthday, and say it's a kind of st a global strategic partnership. So I think it seems to me that uh, China and Russia uh, shakes hand, but I do not think they trust each other. But now they are trying to balance or counterbalance the U.S. primacy in the Asia Pacific, and now they are not satisfied with the existing order in the Asia Pacific and beyond. Uh, so, you know, in, in Japan, you know, now uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, uh, you know, his relation with President Putin looks quite good. And Shinzo Abe wants to resolve the Northern Ireland issue uh, within his term. But it's very unlikely. It's very unlikely. So, but Japan needs, somehow, needs Russia to balance its influence by China in the, you know, Far East, this important area for Japan. U.S., I, I, I do not know, you know, what's the exact relationship between Trump and Putin. But, you know, Russia seems to be a very important factor for U.S. politics. So, you know, how would Russia, you know, it's a kind of, you know, previous hegemon or imperialism, something like that, affect the future course of U.S.-Japan-China relations? It should be uh, cultivated more. And India, uh, we say it's the uh, biggest democratic country in the world. And actually, Japan's company, particularly Suzuki, invested, you know, invested very, you know, you know, huge amount of money in India over the years. But you know, you know, India, we know, you know, it's a, you know, the largest English-speaking country in the world as well. And China, India relations, you know, looks like very complicated. I, I would say they, they, they have never trusted to each other. But some border issue between the two. So how would India, the rising power in Asia? affect the trilateral relations. Uh, it, it should be, you know, researched more in the future. Maybe Hong Kong uh, now, because it, it, it's now. That's why I would say, you know, Hong Kong, you know, in terms of human rights, in terms of U, uh, China and U.S. policy toward Taiwan. And now I am seeing more interaction between Hong Kong and Taiwan. Maybe in terms of one party to, uh, oh, no, sorry, uh, one nation, two systems. And maybe in, in terms of international business and economy, of course, you know, Japan and U.S., you know, uh, you know, makes point of Hong Kong's, you know, international financial center very much. But for China, it seems like more like political, politically important and complicated, particularly at this moment. So I think Hong Kong, what would Hong Kong affect the trilateral relation? Maybe, of course, Hong Kong is not so-called sovereignty, but uh, I think it's quite important to uh, understand what would Hong Kong affect the trilateral relation in the Asia Pacific. So, and finally, and uh, as I said, uh, I think uh, in terms of understanding uh, this very important prioritization, relations, uh, as I said, uh, value and ideology, ideological system might be the most important factor among three factors compared to economic relations and geopolitical and strategic struggle. And in this sense, you know, actually, uh, John Peel, Professor Kebestan, uh, just published very uh, interesting book, uh, China Tomorrow, Democracy or Dictatorship? Democracy or Dictatorship? And actually, uh, let me very, very briefly, one minute, introduce. Uh, 
Uh, he said, uh, according to some explanation, uh, I, I, it's open source. Uh, he said, uh, arguing against, can I? Arguing, I completely agree with him. Uh, arguing against conventional wisdom, this important book makes a compelling case for the con continuing strength of China's one party system. Many analysts have predicted that China's unprecedented economic development and middle class expansion would lead to liberalization of its political regime and a move toward democracy. Instead, leading scholar John Pierre Cabestan uh, contends that the Chinese Communist Party will continue to adapt and prosper in the coming decades, representing a growing challenge to all democracies influenced by China's traditional culture and even more so by the regime's Soviet ideology, institutions, and modus operandi, most Chinese are not pursuing for democracy, choosing security, stability, and prosperity over political freedoms and participation. I would carefully agree uh, with his view. I, 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 maybe Professor Chen have different view, but you know, I, I still think you know, China, China would be somehow exceptional in terms of you know human societies and you know, political system and, and discourse, so maybe um, uh, uh, given my conclusion and analytical framework, I think I I I will be very happy to have your comment in terms of your you know latest latest work. So uh, let me stop here and maybe we can discuss later. Thank you very much. Well. Wow. Thanks a lot, uh, Yoshi, for inviting me. I'm going to stand as well. Um, and uh, well, thanks uh, also for this uh, free uh, page of publicity about my book. I mean, I was not expecting you would talk about my uh, latest book, but uh, uh, it's somewhat related to some of your, the point you've made about the fact that China is, uh, uh, I think, uh, is going to, to keep its own political system for a long term. My final conclusion is that maybe after 20 and 30 years, that maybe for, for some of you it's a kind of, a, a kind of a maybe more hopeful long-term conclusion is that China will change and probably democratize, but the process is going to be complicated and maybe a, a bit bumpy, to say the least. So that's for the long-term future. But I mean, the short-term future, and to link uh, to your wonderful paper, uh, this, this conversation about China's political regime is that we have to sort of uh, make uh, the assumption and, and, and make all our predictions on the basis that the current one-party system will continue. Whether it's going to be hard authoritarian or soft authoritarian, doesn't matter that much actually because the, the clash of values and the ideology will remain um, the, the same. Um, anyway, uh, back to uh, U.S. China, Japan um, relations. Um, I, I love your your your, your working paper. It's a working paper uh, because um, well, it, for what it tells us about Japan, actually, much more than about you know the U.S. and China, because we we've, you know every day we, we read a lot about U.S.-China relations, uh, the trade dispute, the geopolitical confrontation, so. But we, 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 don't, we don't look at uh, Japan very much. And that's, to me, the, one of the major added value of your, of your working paper is to sort of bring Japan in the picture and tell us more about you know, what, how, how significant Japan's factor within the region, East Asia, Asia Pacific region, uh, is important. Um, and uh, now, I think there's a sequencing here. Um, Japan is getting ready, and the Abe administration is getting ready to welcome the um, uh, G20 in Osaka, as you said. Um, next year, I think Japan, the Abe administration, will like to welcome Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, as, in, as, a, as the official guest, and maybe we'll meet the, the, the new emperor, and I mean, it's going to be a state visit. So uh, Japan is in a period of time where um, it wants to play soft with China. It wants to play soft with China, he wants to be a, um, a, a, a good host to the G20. And, 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 and I think Japan wants to play the role of facilitator in the general context. Now, Japan has an interest to do that because China, Japan has been somewhat a victim as, as well, to a less extent than China, of the Trump administration's Asian policy. 
and trade policy. There's been a lot of threats. Uh, what you didn't mention, but I think it's in your paper, that Abe is, uh, I think, the leader who most who who who, who, who met uh, who met Trump the most often in the last uh, two or three years. Since well, even before you know Trump went into office, Abe Shinzo flew to to America to meet the the uh, the, pre the, uh, the 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 uh, the, the future president of the United States because he was worried and he, for good reason of what the Trump administration will do in the region. So, so, so um, I think Japan is in a period of time where it wants to, you know, sort of reach out China. They may and and and, and sort of uh, try to mitigate all the tensions you mentioned about the history, about the Senkaku, about, uh, uh, but also about something I see every day in Asia, but also elsewhere in the world, I go often but for my own research to Africa, I see a degree of competition between China and Japan, uh, particularly in East Asia, in Southeast Asia, and you mentioned Thailand, I could, you know, a lot of cases where both countries compete for uh, economic cooperation, but also diplomatic and, and strategic influence in the region. Um, and. Um, uh, and at the same, well, even if they don't play in the same league in, in, in other parts of the world, in Africa, Latin America. What uh, maybe, and for that reason, the Japanese government now is, is sort of trying to not play too much the geostrategic game with, with China. The interest is to sort of make this tri tri trilateral relationship between China, Japan, and the US working. Um, so, and that's Japan's interest today. In the longer run, I agree with you, these contentious issues will remain part of the picture. And as you indicated, which is, I think, a basic, uh, basic reality and which is a structural reality, Japan is a US ally and will remain a US ally in the long term. Now, the problem with Japan today, if I may say, is that Japan, I mean, that's a dictatorship of uh, geography, is much closer to China than the US. So that's why Japan is concerned about China's rights and needs to sort of deal with China's rights in a much more uh, cautious and uh, um, vigilant manner than the United States, which is further away, which is more powerful. Um, but but that explains you know, what, 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 what you've mentioned. And your conclusion is somewhat um, rather optimistic in a way, but, but maybe true is that trade and economic cooperation is going to sort of, uh, uh, on, in the long run, uh, balance and mitigate the <coughs> geostrategic tensions between the countries in Asia, in particular between China and Japan. And I, I would agree with you. Uh, what Japan believes, very, I think, very much in is the fact that uh, what some people in the Trump administration are looking for or trying to uh, work for is what we call the decoupling of the Chinese and American economy. But I don't think that Japan believes in that. I think Japan believes it's impossible. I agree with you. I think it, may be, it will maybe be true in some sectors of high technology. Uh, is an example, but you know, G5 is an example. But for the rest, I don't think both economies are going to decouple uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future, even ever, uh, because of the level of uh, integration you've mentioned. So one of your conclusions is uh, in your, the policy implication you've mentioned, which is, I think, very important, we have to sort of maybe look beyond the Trump administration, and maybe one day the American administration government will eventually join the TPP, which has been, the, you know, the, which is called now the, CP, the CPTPP, 11, really involving 11, 11 countries in Asia and Latin America, but not, but not the United States. So, and what you've mentioned, which is interesting as well, and is very often, are very often neglected, is the fact that China is not per se against the TPP. Uh, of course, um, China prefers the, the TPP light, which is the RC, RC, RCEP, uh, which is, you know, is not too compelling. It's easy for China and many countries in East Asia to abide by the RCEP uh, uh, guidelines and, and commitments. Uh, you know, the TPP bar is pretty high for, for a country like China. Uh, but, but China is not per se opposed to the TPP. And, and that's an interesting, interesting uh, I think, point. Now, um, I don't have much time, so I don't want to sort of uh, uh, dwell too much on that. The US side. Um, yes, Joe, I think the trade dispute goes beyond uh, trade. It's a part of the geostrategic rivalry. 
I put it bluntly, I, I, I think where there is a consensus in the US, and that's maybe a problem for, China, for, for Japan as well as for China, but because it sort of challenges the rules of the game to some degree, is that, I don't know whether there are Americans in the room, but I don't think that the US will accept uh, that China will become the first, uh, the first uh, superpower in the world. I think China, the US will do at its utmost to prevent that from a technological point of view and military point of view. Uh, it doesn't mean that China won't become the first economy in the world. I think that's something which is more or less pre predictable uh, and, and predicted. But uh, whether China can become the number one superpower is something that I don't think that the US will accept. Now, and that brings us to a very tricky question. Why I agree with you that ideology, difference of uh, political values are important. And maybe it tend to sort of intensify the power competition between China and the US. I have some doubts whether it's the only factor. Uh, power competition, maybe you know, uh, it's part of the world history. I mean, if you read a Graham Allison's book, uh, uh, a number of powers which sometimes share the same ideologies went to war. Uh, the only good, nice exception is Britain, you know, the power transition between Britain and the United States at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, but there are a lot of cases where actually didn't go that smoothly. So maybe the power transition between China, if it occurs, but it's not a done deal, uh, will be smoother, maybe we will be, would be better accepted if China were a democratic country. But let's imagine China becomes democratic tomorrow, maybe which is not going to happen, but well, let's imagine. Do you think that the power competition between the US and China will stop in the South China Sea? Uh, well, as you remember, the, South, the Nan Dash Line was designed by Chiang Kai-shek, not by, well, the 11 Dash Line. Uh, the RU is more debatable, but uh, I think the nationalist government was also in favor of uh, getting back uh, the RU Tai, uh, and, and so on. And Taiwan is part of China for both nationalists, and even it's not the case of the DPP in Taiwan. But uh, so, so power competition will carry, carry on. So, we have to be careful because I don't think uh, if China becomes, you know, multi-party democracy, it will become less nationalist. I, I, I just, uh, I, I wanted to put that on the table so for, so, well, not only for simulating the debate, but as a kind of an issue which I think we need to keep keep in mind. Um, strong leaders, yes. I don't have well, well, well strong leader, yes. But Xi Jinping maybe is less strong than a year ago. Uh, what's happening in Hong Kong? Uh, the, the, uh, what's happening within China with the slowdown of the economy, uh, the, the local government debt, and so on. I think there are a number of issues. And, and, and a growing contestation of Xi Jinping's rule within the Communist Party. Now, we don't know much. I mean, how strong is the opposition to Xi Jinping within the Communist Party and the Central Committee? Uh, I, it's a black box, as you know. So I, I would want to speculate. I know that some, it's easy to know that academics, some academics are opposed to Xi Jinping, have, have some views about the way, you know, it, he amended the constitution and so on, and uh, the way he also um, approached the trade war, his rigid approach to the trade negotiation. And I think there are some differences of um, tactics and maybe strategy between Xi Jinping and one of his advisors who is well known, uh, Liu He, who is, I think, more liberal and more reformist, at least, than Xi Jinping himself. Uh, so, I mean, that, this uh, domestic dimension is important to, to bear in mind. There is one, you, you, yes, you, you, I don't want to be too long, but just two things. Uh, you, you, you mentioned, you didn't mention, well, you said at the end that you didn't mention external actors. Yes, uh, uh, they, they matter, they matter. Uh, what I see, uh, it's not, not only Abe, but the Abe, Abe administration has been very keen to reach out a number of uh, friends and allies or, or partners in Asia, all the way from India to Vietnam and other countries, even Russia, as you, as you mentioned. I would add to that the fact that there are a lot of um, um, there is a lot of cooperation and also um, communication between uh, NATO countries, you know, European NATO countries, uh, and, and Japan on security issues. I know that the French Navy is cooperating very closely with the Japanese Navy in the Pacific. We, we conduct a joint uh, exercise. And that's part of the new, you know, re rebalancing and trying to, I mean, a number of countries, even countries which are, are, are not present from a military point of view, uh, in Asia, like France and the UK or Germany, are sort of now more involved in the South China Sea issue. I mean, they, they want to make a point in, in, in sailing through the South China Sea to, uh, 
remind China that uh, they, sh they should abide by the international law. So those actors, I, th I think they can play a, a, a bit, uh, well, some, some role at least in this equation. Finally, there's one thing, and we'll finish on that, you haven't mentioned at all, and I think will be interesting to have your view on that, is the issue of climate change. To what extent climate change is going to affect the, this trilateral relation? The fact you haven't mentioned it tells a lot about you know, how other issues are important and how this issue, how much this issue has been sidelined in East Asia compared to, I mean, every time you go to Europe, I mean, that's the first question people ask, uh, whether China is going to abide by the climate change commitments she has made. And, 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 and so that's something maybe we can also bring in, in the discussion. Uh, but I like very much your, your conclusions, your policy and recommendation. I agree with you that war is not an option. I hope that uh, China is not going to push too much on Taiwan. I don't think it will, actually. Um, I think the U.S. remains very committed to Taiwan security. But um, there are some flashpoints which uh, I think we, look, we need to look very carefully. Korea is one of them. Uh, maybe on Korea there will be some kind of uh, 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 common ground between China and the U.S. in order to put pressure on the North Korean regime. But we'll see how it goes because at the same time, both Beijing and, China and Washington also compete, for instance, in the Korean Peninsula. So it's a, it's a game where both big powers cooperate to some degree, but also compete. And that's put Japan in a difficult situation because uh, Korea is very close to Japan. And you know how much the missiles and, and the nuclear uh, program of North Korea is something which affects actually much more Japan uh, security than the US security in the first place. So on that note, I will finish, and, and, and thank you again for inviting me and, and for your very nice uh, working paper. I, mean, who, I hope you will can get a copy or uh, at least read it on, on the web. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yoshi, and thank you very much, uh, Jean-Pierre. Um, I'm wondering, Yoshi, whether you wanted to respond to uh, Professor Cabestan's uh, reaction? Uh, uh, just two points. I think uh, one is uh, maybe the relationship between the divergence of political s political system and power competition. This is more based on you know so-called power politics. You know we we have seen a lot of times over the history, like you know 19th century, you know and 20th century in Europe particularly, the war of history. So I think, but now I think my point is uh, this divergence of political system ideology and development model uh, would be much easier to be to trigger this geopolitical and strategic struggles. Mm. In this mm. sense, I think mm. uh, divergence and disparities of political system might be, I mean, for the relations among Japan, China, and US, more important. And now maybe China is becoming more like, you know, uh, different or exceptional. Maybe under Xi Jinping administration, may, might be changed maybe in the next 20 or 30 years, no, who knows? But at this moment, uh, I would carefully argue this point, this is one <coughs> response. And climate change, uh, I think this is very global issue, uh, more than you know, Asia Pacific, oh, yeah, yeah. more than US, Japan, China. But I think, you know, of course, Jap and Japan, you know, like Kyoto Protocol, right? And China and US, you know, for the bilateral relations now, I think the climate change, maybe now, seems to be less mm. important, but you know, back to five or 10 years ago, you know, uh, US and China you know, uh, actually were discussing very carefully and you know, you know, deliberately this issue. And now, may, uh, now it's not, it, seems, it seems not like you know, on the table or diplomatic agenda between US and China. Mm. Maybe more important issues. Yes, but because Trump doesn't care about it. Yeah, but I think Japan is very you know, sticky to this issue and the climate change you know, continues to be Quite important. So, you know, a lot of works to be done in the future uh, for me and maybe for the Institute, you know, climate change, you know, Russia, India, you know, new technology, right, fintech, you know, these important factors, you know, could be, you know, uh, um, you know more carefully researched and took into consideration. Yes. Can I make two brief sure. points? Yes. Um, uh, I forgot to mention one thing I, I wanted to mention is the fact that the, well, the Trump administration, at least until very recently, uh, didn't care much about human rights. You know, I mean, this, uh, the, the Xinjiang issue, the Uyghur issue, was raised very, very recently within the Trump administration. Uh, and now, of course, the Trump, I mean, you can see Pompeo trying to use Hong Kong as a leverage, 
but do they really care about human rights? I have some doubts. I mean, among the conservative people in the US, do they care about power, power military thing? Climate change, uh, maybe that could, be, could become a, a policy recommendation in your uh, mm -hmm. sort of another version of the, uh, <coughs> to sort of engage China uh, of the part of Japan. Because Japan can, on that issue, because, well, forget about Trump, but for the moment at least, but Japan can sort of engage China uh, on, on climate change. And, and this will be a way of sort of reaching out uh, the Chinese government uh, on an issue on which I think both countries share interest. Yeah. more than differences. Thank you very much. Um, if I might just maybe bring this back to the G20, if I could, um, before we go uh, to our discussion. Um, if you look at the, the nature of the G20, the, the G20 is really is not about geopolitics, not about mm. security issues. It is a, uh, the premier forum mm. for managing the global economy. So um, a lot of the issues, you know, they just say Korean Peninsula or security in the region, uh, these are just not on the agenda of the G20. Now that said, right, if you again think about the G20 as um, an institution of global governance, right, in some ways now taken over from the, the G8, G7 to be this premier forum for managing the global economy. Um, one cannot help but see how um, other issues, uh, domestic issues in certain countries, regional issues, uh, and issues that have nothing to do or that don't relate to directly to the global economy, economics or trade, uh, that they impinge on the dynamics within the G20. I mean, that, it goes without saying. And the G20 really came to its own after the crisis of 2008, 2009, when the G8, G7 um, ceded the position of management of the global economy. Now, if you looked at so if you looked at the agenda of the G20, I did just go through it very quickly. The main themes that Japan has written out. The G, G20 does not have a secretariat, so very much the the agenda is driven by the um, president, the sitting president of the, of the, of the G20, the, the um, country that uh, uh, holds the presidency. Top theme is global economy. So you think, well, what are the economic conditions that are uh, um, at play in the world today, given many of the things that are happening? So for example, a lot of the geopolitical issues, the, the bilateral disagreement between the United States and China, um, uh, uh, the the um, disputes that the United States has with uh, its trading partners. A lot of these issues are now impinging, particularly the trade war between the United States, are now impinging on the global economy. So that's part of the discussion. I would add that Japan has a very strong interest in infrastructure uh, development. So a big part of their agenda in the global economy is what is pushing their agenda on what's called quality infrastructure investment. Mm -hmm. So so you'll mm -hmm. see that just uh, a, a, a few weeks ago, uh, the finance ministers and central bank governors of the G20 did um, approve a set of principles on quality infrastructure investment. Now, it, what I'm trying to put here is you know, connect some dots. So if you have that issue, right, quality infrastructure investment as a big issue for Japan on the global economy theme, well then one has to talk about the Belt and Road Initiative, right? And quality infrastructure investment versus Belt and Road, well, you get the point, right? So, 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 the, so there is some dynamic there that we also need, we need to understand, right? Now, China has signed on to these new principles so what does that say about the BRI? Are they now willing to take on the criticism uh, that the BRI has received? So th that's one question. Uh, another theme is trade and investment. So trade and investment, of course, at the top of this issue has to be the US-China trade war, right? What is the impact of the US-China trade war? But also, uh, right, we have to think about the WTO and WTO reform. That would be very high on the particularly we're heading the end of this year mm -hmm. 
to a situation where the United States has continued to block um, appointment of dispute settlement adjudicators at WTO. So by the end of this year, beginning of next year, there won't be enough WTO adjudicators to actually do the dispute settlement adjudication, which would, which would mean that the WTO's business would grind to a halt. And so what, what does that mean for the multilateral trade system? So again, you have a, a theme, a, a, a goal in defending the multilateral trade system, um, but then some domestic issues related to uh, the situation in the United States and the trade war that might impinge on it. Innovation, this is another theme, right? We talk about data security, the free flow of data. Look at that theme, but again, we have to think in the context of what's happening, the dynamics outside this, uh, the, the, the G20, the dynamics between the United States and China on disputes over, say, Huawei, cybersecurity issues that are uh, uh, broiling, or that are roiling between the United States and China. So, so again, there, there you, you, you have this G20 theme, this goal of trying to come together on an issue but there are a lot of underlying sort of political, geopolitical issues and competitive issues uh, between countries. Um, I go a little bit faster. Environment and energy, mm. right? another theme. Again, you have the goal of climate change, mm. the issue of plastics in the oceans mm. is very important, but you have a situation where the United States has pulled out of mm. the COP21 agreement. So what does that mean? Mm. Right? Um, and, um, and, 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 and what does that actually mean in terms of the ability for Japan to move forward on you know, a climate change agenda uh, under the G20 auspices? Employment. We have a, you know, that is very important for, for, for Japan because, of course, they're aging demographic. Right? So, but, and, and, but, it, but the future of work very much relates to, back to the technology and innovation question. So what does it then mean in terms of uh, Japan pushing forward on its, on its employment agenda? And um, uh, I, I just mentioned the others very quickly, women's empowerment, uh, development, and health issues. So in fact, the WHO uh, is, um, is going to be present with the representative of the G20. I would just mention health uh, very much uh, on the agenda for Japan uh, this year because of its um, aging populations, aging demographics. So um, I guess what the picture that I wanted to put forward here you know, to understand our discussion and why it's relevant, I think, to, to look at the dynamics of US, China, Japan relationship, the tri tri trilateral relation. Because whilst we have this G20, this um, premier institution for managing the global economy, an, in, an organization for global governance, not unlike say, the WTO or uh, the World Health Organization, underneath it, so roiling underneath this attempt to bring order, a rules-based international order, you have roiling these different dynamics between countries, bilateral issues, regional issues, and even domestic issues. You know, for those uh, um, uh, believers in uh, uh, Robert Putnam's two-level game, mm. you'll be familiar with, with, with that issue, you know, the, how domestic politics can inform foreign policy, the connection, the ne mm. nexus between domestic politics and foreign policy. We see it at play more than ever, more than ever these days, right? And frankly, a major issue is what do we do about the rules-based international order today? How do we defend it? Do we defend the rules-based international order, or do we try to find a new kind of rules-based international order? And therein lies my, so, so therein lies, I think, the biggest challenge overlying in connecting what we're talking about in terms of the trilateral relations and this system of global governments represented by the G20. So in fact, I would put my, Question to, to Yoshi, because you, I think, rightly identify the question of values and ideology as being quite kind of a, an important aspect of, of, of these 
relationships. Right? Now, if, and, and indeed, it, one would argue a clash of the values and ideologies. Now, I, I just came from uh, working at the Canadian Foreign Ministry, and for us, uh, for, sorry, I'm, I'm using us now, because I'm thinking back to my old job, but uh, for Canada, a big priority was defending the rules-based international order. Now, if you listen to our, to the Canadian Foreign Minister, she will add the word liberal, usually, defending the liberal rules-based international order. Now, one could argue, right, okay, this is a very noble effort. We created a rules-based international order, the United States taking the lead after the Second World War in doing so, uh, Europe and, um, uh, and, and countries like Canada, but now we're at an inflection point where China is posing a challenge to the rules-based international order. India is doing so. Many other countries are posing challenges to the rules-based international order that we know. And so we're trying to understand our, what kind of rules-based international order do we want? Do we want to defend the one that exists, strengthen what exists, or come up with something new? The answer that seems to be coming from the West is to focus on values and say, these are our values from the West, right? So I put it to you, Yoshi, is this a non-starter? Is this a good idea to talk about values when we're talking about um, you know, a, what, what, what some have called a clash of civilizations, right? That uh, are we in an impossible task if the West, a country like Canada, wants to defend the rules-based international order, but uh, focuses on values and not being more pragmatic and just saying, well, what, can, what sort of rules can we have that may not have anything to do with values? Can we have such a thing? Yeah. I see your point. Uh, you know, looking at the class of civilization, you know, right by Samuel Huntington, you know, Japan is an independent civilization different with the West. Mm. But, you know, if we say the rules and value based multilateralism or order, I, I think uh, among US, Canada, and Japan, you know, we are seeing the same point. Well, we have shared the same concept on value. What is the value? What's the definition of the value? And I think if now we are, when we talk about economic globalization, free trade, fair trade, or you know, these multilateral arrangement or regional organization. I think uh, we, uh, you know, we and China, you know, we said G7, you know, we said G7 and China, we could have some common interests and common concepts. But you know, you know, when it comes to value, maybe China could agree with globalization and China now is standing up to protect the liberal, uh, they, they have never said liberal, but the globalization, economic globalization, and free and fair trade system. And China now is, China is insisting now the US is doing against this existing order and multilateralism. So I think the landscape is, looks like very complicated, you know, but I, I, but I think, first of all, um, uh, Japan, US, Canada and uh, most of the so-called Western countries, we have shared the basic concept and definition on value. But uh, I, I, I can't deny or neglect, uh, I mean, toward the China's political system or ideology, because of China's political system and very different ideology, uh, it's very easy to have some prejudice or bias. When we talk about, when we try to, you know, share something, you know, conceptual, you know, things with China, it's very easy to have prejudice or bias, and and we, it's very easy to say, oh, we are different. You you are talking about your value, we are talking about our value, and we are different. But actually, you know, at least in economic, you know, aspects, I think China and the rest of the world, we could have some common concepts or interest, but I think uh, why I, I would say, you know, ideology and 
ideology and political system is relevant is because why this prejudice happened? Why, why do we, the rest of the world, always distrust the China statistics? You know, <coughs> even if China, China is doing very good, we still do not trust. Why? This is not because they are doing bad. Because of our own you know, existing framework of thinking. <coughs> and this would affect, even undermine, our mutual communication and understanding. So, you know, your, your question is great and very complicated. Uh, what, what are we, you know, what the value we are talking about? I would say we can share, but it's very difficult to, you know, really, you know, reach out to the same point to maximize our own interest, particularly under the Trump and Xi Jinping's administration leadership. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, I wonder whether any you know, separating, putting economics and trade in a box is, is even possible in this debate. Because, I mean, if you think about what's happened here in Hong Kong over the last uh, week or so, um, in some ways it's about the rule of law, right? It's mm -hmm. about do we trust the rule of law uh, in the mainland? And uh, because Hong Kong, do Hong Kong people do so? And then, um, you know, that, that businesses have come out uh, you know, in, in support of the demonstrations, suggests that the rule of law is very much an, you know, an economic issue, a business issue, uh, uh, you know, in, in particular. Uh, so, it's, it's very difficult to, you know, to remove that. Uh, I'm wondering, um, Jean-Pierre, you whether you had something to react to, to, to that too as well? well you don't uh, have to. Yes, well, very briefly, <laughs> uh, two things. Um, the victors of World War II, when they created the United Nations, they agree upon um, basic values, including the Soviets, actually. The Soviet Union agreed upon. And among the draft of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you had one guy from China who was presenting the ROC, one, uh, I forgot his name, but he's well known, one, one Lebanese representing the Arab world, and, and, and then some Western, a French guy called René Cassin, well known jurist. And, and they tried to reach out, I mean, to sort of, sort of uh, set a, a number of values which every civilization could agree with. And that's important to remind that, because even the Chinese government today, has, you know, in joining the United Nations in 71, has abided by, by those values. I mean, claim to abide by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. No. That's one thing. The second thing is about multilateralism. I think China, <laughs> today's China is more clever than the U.S., because China claims to, to, you know, to, to embrace globalization, to play the multilateral game, to abide by WTO rules. Uh, in reality, she doesn't. We know that. I mean, there are restrictions, not all the time, but she, she has infringed a number of WTO rules. She has abused its, its, its status of uh, developing economy, non-market economy. So that's one of the reasons the Trump administration in the US is so unhappy with, and not only the US, the Euro European Union is also very unhappy with China. You know, I mean, if you look at the latest document produced by the, the EU, EU Commission, it was very critical of China's uh, Chinese commercial practices. The Trump administration is more clumsy in a way, saying that we're against multilateralism. We, we want to conclude bilateral trade because we are in, in bilateral trade agreements, we are in a strong position, so we can impose a condition. Okay, but that, that's, that's not very clever to say that. So you wouldn't agree that... But, but I, don't, I think China and, and Xi Jinping have been very good at promoting globalization and multilateralism mm -hmm. without practicing it well. Yes. That's my So would you, would you agree, though, with, with, the, with, with the assertion by some that today the biggest violator of the rules in the rules-based international is the United States? Both the U.S. and China. <laughs> Both the U.S. and China. Right? Uh, differently. I mean, uh, China... Well, I mean, human rights is one issue, uh, trade, uh, trade uh, arrangements is another issue. The, the trouble with trade, you know, there's market access, subsidies, and uh, all those issues we, which are on the table. Uh, both in the EU, I mean, between the EU and China, maybe to some degree between China, Japan and China, but also between the US and China. So, um, so everybody is in favor of multilateralism, but uh, practices differently. Uh, but but with the U.S. I mean today the Trump administration has been very much opposed to that. I mean, nope. At least to some degree. Well, we have to be careful because Pompeo sometimes will say, "Well, we, we embrace multilateralism as well." 
and G20 is, is, is a multilateral setting, which, oh, by the way, which is something you didn't mention, which was created at the time of the financial crisis in order to manage the world economy. And now that one of the key objectives of the G20 meeting in Osaka will be how to, how to manage the slowdown of the economy and not to sort of precipitate most economy in a recession. I mean, that's, that will be pretty high, I think, in the agenda. Actually, the G20 was started much earlier yeah, as yeah, a finance I mean, minister's group and then became the yeah, leader summit. So you're right, it was upgraded to yeah. by, by Because uh, by Bush, for by my sins, 17 years ago when I was working in the Canadian Foreign Ministry, I wrote a paper okay, okay, yeah, on no, right, yeah, yeah. Why, yeah. why the G20 should be raised from finance ministers up yeah, to, yeah. to leaders. Sorry. And then it was finally implemented <laughs> in in, to, uh, in, in 2008. Um, before I open up to questions, I, I wanted to ask Yoshi another question about Prime Minister Abe's leadership. We will see it on full display in the next week. So, right? And he's become, in some ways, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, is it wrong to characterize him as maybe becoming the Merkel of Asia? Uh, you know, uh, could, could it be as Merkel moves, leaves the scene that perhaps we, we have Abe? Because he seems to have some kind of um, unusual knack for getting along with, you have Trump and now he, uh, you mentioned um, uh, cooperation in third countries and you specifically mentioned Thailand. And very specifically, that's just a few week, a couple of weeks ago that the, um, uh, no, I, I think it was a couple of weeks ago that the, the Thai cabinet, the, the cabinet in Thailand, uh, they approved uh, a high-speed rail project that, in fact, is um, uh, led by CP Group of Thailand, but includes a Chinese uh, company and uh, two Japanese entities. So it's a, it's a, a, a concrete example oh, of uh, of Chinese Japanese cooperation in a third country. Right, on, on high-speed rail, which, again, if you look at the infrastructure question, uh, what we've been seeing is competition between uh, Japan and China, you know, BRI versus quality infrastructure and that sort of thing. So I'm wondering if you could um, tell us a bit about uh, where you see Abe and his role uh, today in the world. Yeah, I think uh, uh, as in terms of hosting uh, G20, I think for Japan, uh, we have basically three things we can do. One is uh, providing platform uh, for discussing global issues. And uh, sometimes uh, providing some platform for Trump and Xi Jinping, the bilateral you know, meeting held in Osaka. So this is one, uh, uh, one thing what I, we can do. The second thing is raising up some agenda, even try to set agenda like climate change, global issue, and third point is, you know, integrate and lead the discussion and conclude to relatively shared and common, you know, statement or something like that. So this is, uh, in terms of hosting G20 summit, uh, I think uh, not only Japan, you know, in the previous host, right? But at the, particularly at this moment, Japan is trying to do these three things in order to enhance Japan's international uh, leadership and position and maybe for, for Abe, contributes to his own domestic political capital. So this is what Shinzo Abe is trying to do. And I think for Japan, uh, actually, uh, you know, both of two uh, raised up some few things. I think for now, because Japan, you know, we, we have some constraint in terms of constitution. It's very limited and few things uh, to do in military and, you know, defense area. So I think now some consensus, I think maybe this is what I concluded. But you know, what can Japan do in terms of so-called international co contribution? I think one is environment. Environment, health, and infrastructure. And these three things are basically you know, shared among Japan's you know, different sectors, in my understanding, in my understanding. So, so, so maybe, All right. yeah. Sorry, questions, please. Um, uh, Sorry, we went on a bit long. So yes, please, yes. Can you introduce yourself and your affiliation, please? Thank you. OK. Sorry? OK, I'm Patrick uh, from the think tank of uh, uh, Great China in London. And uh, after 
sharing our in, uh, introduction and information and knowledge, I have so many ideas. Firstly, I quite agree with uh, you, Yu from Japan. Yeah. Uh, I still think that between China, Japan, and USA, this is a trade war is just a superficial. Actually, it's a war of values and ideology. But after so many rounds of discussion, we know everything clearly. Now, from the Chinese side, I think very strategic, strategic. As this gentleman said, it's very clever performances in fight against USA, particularly. Domestically, <clears throat> I think that everybody knows that from top-down structure is intensified in the past several years, especially currently. If you really find the, the CCTV from, from China or the people daily, <coughs> everyone knows clearly it's a propaganda war. Now it strongly target the US government, mm -hmm. particularly the Trump president. Without any, uh, how to say, everything is open now, open war. On the other side, G20, uh, some meeting in the, in the coming days, everyone knows it is uh, useless. Actually, it's a game. Nothing practically, maybe effectively, to be concluded or obtained. Uh, because uh, uh, this... Uh, can you just be brief, uh, concise? Yes. Be, be concise. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we can get more people. <clears throat> so, from this point uh, of view, what I want to say, uh, you three or you two, what kind of uh, a prospect can you maybe predict or a judge or the maybe for the future between the war of China and USA okay. instead of Japan? Just the two sides. Okay, that, that's a very. Uh, we'll, we'll 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 yeah. collect some other questions, please, uh, and comments, uh, mm -hmm. and then we'll 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 have them respond. Maybe maybe two more from here. Yes, please, uh, sir. Um, so what's the, Could you I'm, introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Lawrence Chen. I'm one of the staff of uh, Hong Kong U yes. at the Faculty of Business. Um, you mentioned about the uh, clashes on values, political systems, ideology. You mentioned quite a bit on that. Well said. Uh, I hate to use this word, but I think the, the real clash is actually race. I really oh, right. hate to use this word, but it's very fundamental. Of course, it's reflected by values and systems, different kinds of constitutions, because of course, unfortunately, in the US uh, or from China side, when we look at each other, most people won't be able to understand, right, the, the, the political systems, your constitutions versus mine, and things like that. But we will form a very strong impression based on, of course, a few impolite tourists from China in, in New York or Paris will jeopardize all your study on the differences in uh, democracy, uh, uh, voting, election systems, everything. So that would lead to clashes. And it's actually not G20, it's 1.4 billion versus 300 million. Well, you have 20 presidents talking to each other with rule books, right? You have rule books, you have, uh, and by the way, a lot of people, of course, is trying to throw away the Sir, rule books. Yeah, concise. So this is the point I would like to share, right? Following your comment on ideology and civilizations and, and clashes of values. My next question is, okay, sure. there are people talking about, okay, uh, worrying about China will continue to grow and become quite uh, mature and, and developed continuously using the the uh, uh, current communist systems for the next 50 years, for example, will the West accept this? Uh, uh, that, okay, well, as long as they don't ex export it like many years ago, the export of communism. So with the, also let, let them stay there with their way as long as they don't infringe into the, the West and try to rewrite the blue book, would they accept that or will people say, look, let's try to think about the acceptance? Great. Okay. Uh, anybody else uh, would like to contribute? Uh, lady behind you, yes. Hi. Uh, 
Yeah, could you introduce yourself? Hi, hi I'm a reporter from SCMP. Uh, I want to ask two questions. One is, what's your expected interaction between the Chinese and United States leaders during G20? Another question is, um, G20 are you are you leaders. optimistic that the two countries can settle the trade dispute via the G20 summit? Thank you. And indeed, uh, as last year, uh, the meet, the potential meeting between uh, President Xi and President Trump could overshadow uh, the G20 this year as it did in Buenos Aires last year. Uh, okay, so um, uh, okay, one 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 more. We 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 we, okay. we should do more than four. Yes. Uh, I foresee the extended context of trade, okay, for whatever you label it. In the G20, how would the head of finance group really think forward in terms of a potential slowdown? My worry is, and the question is, would the MMM, the modern monetary model or modern monetary theory, in some way got into the central bank policy unspoken strategy. And this will, will be very controversial. Um, I think we should uh, go back to our uh, panelists, please. Uh, any comments, you can take them all or take some of them. Up to you. You go first. Ayoshi, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, can I? I can pick up. Yeah, yeah, please, okay. whatever, whatever you like. Um, uh, race, uh, yeah, I don't know, but you know, it, it, it's important, you know, maybe out of, you know, prejudice or, you know, misunderstanding. And uh, whether, you know, the rest of the world uh, accept, you know, the communist China or something like that, I think, you know, this is not a problem, you know, of acceptance or not acceptance, you know, it's a reality. So we need to face and we need to be ready. Uh, that's why you know I'm trying to figure out you know how you know uh, should we be ready for that. You know, this is my point. Uh, G20. I think uh, you know at least of course now in the administrative or in high official level, you know, U.S. and China have been still you know very you know confrontational and a lot of you know you know you know how to say disagreements. So I think it it takes a long time. And even if you know U.S. and China concludes to some agreement, this in my understanding, this does mean they agree to how to manage the economic and trade issue. So I think you know, we shouldn't over-evaluate this agreement. But now, you know, <laughs> Trump and uh, Xi Jinping, at least they are trying to maintain its personal relationship to avoid the, you know, avoid the de deterioration of US-China bilateral relations. So this is maybe a good news uh, for G20 and beyond. But I do not think, you know, the, uh, the through ho for Japan through hosting the G20 summit, you know, U.S. and China can uh, can agree, you know, to each other or you know, you know, you know, launch some, you know, public, you know, statements or something like that. I do not, I do not think like that. But you know, for Japan, maybe it's a kind of a chance to provide this platform for Xi Jinping and Trump to sit together. This means a lot for <coughs> Japan. This means a lot for Japan. Um, yeah, this is basically what I must say. All right, uh, very briefly, because we're approaching the end of this uh, very uh, nice discussion. War. Uh, well, you have to bear in mind that uh, China and the US are nuclear powers. They have nuclear weapons. To me, nuclear weapon is a, be is a, is a good obstacle to war. In the sense that you better think twice before starting a war with another nuclear power. Wh whichever side starts the war. Um, it needs to sort of contemplate that risk very carefully. That's why I, I tend to uh, agree with you that, of course, uh, the, for instance, the Taiwan Strait is a dangerous uh, part of East Asia, but whether China is going to launch a war against Taiwan, knowing that the U.S. will react, uh, the stakes are pretty high. That's why I believe more in the, um, the, uh, the, the use of uh, United Front strategy and in order to bring the Taiwanese with back to back within the Chinese uh, nation, but but that's uh, you know that's one thing. About. What, what China has been good regarding uh, taking risks is what has been you know mentioned everywhere by experts is using gray zones uh, in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea. China has been very good at using its militia, maritime militia, and coast guards, all the gray zones in order to establish some kind of domination in South China Sea. You know, building 
artificial islands without uh, actually ejecting or kick, uh, kicking out the Filipinos or the Vietnamese from the uh, from the land the land feature they occupy. So that's that's I think where, where China's strategy today. Race. Um, there was someone who was not very clever in the Trump administration who mentioned that it was the first time that maybe a non-Caucasian nation will dominate the world. Karen Skinner. I mean, it yeah. must be a wasp. I mean, the U.S. is a multiracial country. How can she say such a thing? I mean, it's so mad. Uh, yeah, I know. No, and I understand, I understand Asian, Asian people's reaction. What does it mean? I mean, that's not the issue. <laughs> Clearly, it's not the issue. Um, you've got a lot of Asian country, people, including within the Chinese nation, who believe in democracy and human rights. I mean, it's not a question of race. I mean, are, the clash of values is within China, actually. I think the Chinese people and the societies are divided about what political value should be promoted. Uh, anyway, that's a... Yes, exactly. You know, it's something which was accepted, I mean, by the Chinese uh, all the way back to 45. Now, why people are against Pushajaja, universal values in China itself? I mean, that's a question for China, not for me. Anyway, uh, China power, uh, will the uh, Communist Party, Communist system will ever be accepted? Well, we, we, we feign to accept it. I, I, I speak as a European, but we will never swallow it. I mean, it will always be a problem. That's why I was there. Of course, we will continue to cooperate, to engage China, to try to sort of have economic relations. But that will be always, I mean, as you mentioned, there will always be an obstacle to real partnership and real understanding and, 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 and establishing trust between us and, and the Chinese government. I'm not talking about the society, I'm just talking about the political system in the government. But that's, a, that's my own view. Uh, interaction, whether, I think the trade, uh, well, it's hard to tell. I mean, the question from the, the reporter from the AFC is, is, a, is a good one, but I, it's very hard to predict. Well, I, see the, I see a partial agreement. I, see, I think they're going to agree upon something, you know, um, but, but not, a, not a global agreement. I mean, there are so many issues which have not been solved yet, so we'll see. Now, of course, a slowdown is of the, economy, the world economy is a big issue, and uh, um, I think we will try to sort of, uh, all countries will try to, to, to sort of uh, uh, um, mitigate that trend, but uh, uh, it, well, yes, it depends. It depends not only on the on the out of the upon the outcome of the U.S.-China trade negotiations, but all other types of trade negotiations uh, between the EU and China and so on. So I think we have to stay close to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we just hit the time. Uh, so I, I'm sorry that we didn't have as much. Uh, uh, entertained as many questions uh, from the audience uh, like, but I think our panelists will be here, and maybe if you wish to uh, engage them uh, individually, uh, I'm sure they would welcome it. I know that uh, Professor Gabistan has got to go uh, back to his uh, his home uh, university uh, shortly, but um, it just remains for me to thank you very much for coming, and uh, uh, please uh, uh, come again. Thank you very much.